Cornucopia Radio presents Wendy Sewell was 32 years of age, married and worked in the offices of the Forestry Commission in the town of Bakewell, Derbyshire, England. On Wednesday, the 12th of September, 1973, John Osmerston, who was a district officer for the commission, said he heard Wendy in conversation with a man. He did not see this person, but described his voice as being high-pitched and agitated. Later, around lunchtime that day, John was speaking on the telephone in his office. Wendy walked into the room and handed him a note. She was going out for some fresh air. Several people saw Wendy walking along Butts Road, just a short distance from the Commission's office. She was seen to enter the main entrance of Bakewell Cemetery off Yeld Road. One witness said he saw her enter the ground at around 12.50pm. Another person who saw Wendy in the cemetery that day was a 17-year-old groundsman employed by the local authority to work at the cemetery. He said he saw Wendy walk into the ground just as he was finishing off his cigarette. He then walked into the unconsecrated chapel, used as a storeroom for the ground workers, collected his drinks bottle and walked through the grounds and out of the main cemetery gates to visit the nearby shop. On his return, he found Wendy Sewell lying on one of the paths within the graveyard. She had been savagely beaten around the head with a pickaxe handle that was left at the scene. Her trousers, pants and plimsolls had been removed and her bra had been pulled up to expose her breasts. After trying to administer first aid, he sought help from the cemetery attendant who lived in a house within the grounds. Both went to where Wendy had been lying, but she had moved, or been moved, from the original location. Soon, other cemetery workers joined them. Police arrived shortly after. Wendy, who was still conscious, was taken to Chesterfield Royal Infirmary. En route, she thrashed around and appeared resistant to the attempts to administer aid to her. Wendy Sewell died two days later from her horrific injuries without being able to give the police any information about who had attacked her. The 17-year-old groundsman was charged on the day of the attack with the attempted murder and remanded into custody. After Wendy's death, the charge was amended to one of murder. The teenager remained in custody until his trial. The trial was heard at Nottingham Crown Court in February 1974 and lasted three days. And when the jury returned from their deliberations, the foreman announced the verdict. He was guilty of murder. The following podcast is brought to you by True Crime Investigators UK. But who are they? John was a police officer for 30 years working locally and nationally as a detective. Sally was also a police officer for 12 years and then retrained as a lawyer and practiced in criminal law. Now they are both retired and review cases of interest, some solved, some undetected. Throughout this series, they will discuss the cases they are reviewing and interview relevant parties, including police officers, suspects, witnesses and experts. The first case for review is the murder in 1973 of Wendy Sewell in Bakewell Cemetery and the subsequent conviction of local teenager Stephen Downing. So when did we first have the idea for the podcast? It would be about... Uh, a year ago, end of last year, we started listening to podcasts and particularly true crime podcasts because that's our background, our interest. And we found that many of them were, although very good, they were more scripted than we would have liked. And our idea developed from there where we thought we would do a more interview based podcast. And that's how the idea sort of ran. However, we realised that we hadn't got the experience uh, or the know-how how how to produce a podcast. And that's when we went in search of somebody to to help. And we came across people who could assist in the um, production. And they've been really, really helpful to us. And 
and helped us to come to this point. So here we are on the beginning of our journey. My name's John. And my name's Sally. Welcome to our new True Crime podcast. I've been looking into the case of a man named Stephen Downing, who was charged with the murder of Wendy Sewell in Bakewell, Derbyshire, in 1973. Have you heard of the case? I have heard of the case, yes. I can't say that I knew about it at the time that it happened, because in 1973 I would have only been nine years old. But certainly since that time, I've read books and I've heard documentaries and interviews in relation to uh, to the case. I find it an interesting case. I was uh, a young lad at the time. It was interesting in many respects. A man convicted and served 27 years in prison, subsequently to be released by the Court of Appeal, who stated the conviction wasn't safe. It raises a greater area of uh, interest, and I think it's worthy of our attention to have a look at the case in its entirety. I think you're right, yes. I think the case itself, together with others that were in the court at at that time, the 1970s, I think it raises some serious issues in relation to the detention and the treatment of, uh, of suspects once they're at the police station. In 1984, new legislation was brought in, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which actually became active in... 1986. This introduced safeguards for everybody, but in particular people who were vulnerable or had uh, mental health issues, which prior to 1986 uh, didn't exist. That's right. Before 1986, the rules that the police were governed by were called the judges' rules, and they make no reference to vulnerability by reason of mental capacity or age. And so the Police and Criminal Evidence Act uh, gave certain safeguards to suspects, such as a right to legal advice, a right to refreshment, a right to a break, a right to a good night's sleep. All that kind of thing wasn't covered by the um, by the judge's rules. And in particular, the rights of a vulnerable or person with mental health issues wasn't addressed and protection afforded to them. That's right, isn't it? That is right, yes. And PACE was seen, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, was seen as a very sweeping, very life-changing piece of legislation that that did alter the way that the police treated uh, detained suspects. And I think one of the main reasons the Court of Appeal allowed the appeal was the chances are that the confessions made by Stephen Downing wouldn't have been allowed at the original trial, which made a big difference to the evidence that the jury heard. Is that right? Again, that's that's absolutely right, because Stephen had been detained originally as a as a witness. He'd actually found the body of Wendy Sewell in the cemetery at Bakewell and he was taken by the police to help with their inquiries. However, after eight hours of detention and during that time he didn't have any access to legal advice, neither did he have access to his parents. He was a 17-year-old youth with a reading age of 11. So by today's standards, he would have been referred to as vulnerable. So by the time he'd been in custody and been interviewed for in excess of eight hours, he did actually confess to assaulting Wendy Sewell. And that confession ultimately led to him being charged initially with the attempt murder because Wendy was still alive. However, she died two days later of her injuries and he was charged with the murder. What actually happened on the day in question? Wendy Sewell was a 32-year-old married lady who worked at the Forestry Commission in Bakewell and she worked with a man called John Osmerston. 
She went into his office just before lunchtime. She passed him a note because he was on the telephone to say that she was going out for a breath of fresh air. She subsequently left the office, turned left and left again up onto Butts Road, which is an incline up towards the uh, cemetery. Witnesses saw Wendy Sewell on Butts Road and then subsequently saw her going into the cemetery, the main gates of which are off Yeld Road. She went into the cemetery. She was uh, walking around the cemetery. At work on that day was Stephen Downing. And he leaves the cemetery to go and buy another bottle of pop from the shop, which was only a matter of hundreds of yards away. He walked out of the cemetery gates, went up to the shop, but the shop was closed. So he intended to return back to the cemetery. In doing so, he called at his own house where he spoke to his mum. Shortly afterwards, he walked back down to the cemetery, through the cemetery gates and onto the pathway. And it was then that he found Wendy Sewell. She had clearly been beaten about the head, suffered serious injury and had had some of her clothes removed. Stephen was taken to the police station, initially, as you say, probably as a witness because he was uh, present and found the uh, the body of Wendy Sewell. At the police station, he was, according to the uh, transcripts of the Court of Appeal, he was detained for up to eight hours uh, again, without his parents or a legal representation. And eventually, he admitted the offence that was recorded on in writing and he signed it. What issues do you think are there in respect of the revision of the law? I think the issues are, uh, again, we've already mentioned the word vulnerability. He was vulnerable by by virtue of his age, 17 years of age, but also his mental capacity. Uh, It was recognised that he had some learning difficulties and his reading age was actually that of an 11-year-old. He subsequently uh, told the police that he had actually assaulted Wendy Sewell with a pickaxe handle, uh, delivering two blows, which rendered her semi-conscious I shan't say unconscious she was uh, she was semi-conscious so and for those reasons he made the confession that he made uh, and the police wrote it down and he signed that confession and that subsequently led to his uh, to him being charged with the attempt murder of Wendy Sewell and then two days later when she died he was charged with the murder of Wendy Sewell he went on to repeat his confessions to other professionals, most notably when he was uh, on remand at Risley. Uh, he was seen by a psychiatrist there, or a number of psychiatrists there, and he did repeat the confession that he'd given to the police. I think later on, when it came to the Court of Appeal, um, they accepted that those repeated confessions came within the first two weeks of the 12th of September 1973. So although he'd repeated that confession, it was the very early days and after that initial two weeks, uh, he denied the assault upon, uh, upon Wendy. So we've got a man here who's admitted to the police and admitted to other professionals outside of the police involvement, but the Court of Appeal was still not convinced he was guilty at the end of the day. No, it was a very short trial that he had. It was only two days, and I think I'm right in saying that the jury only took less than a couple of hours to come to their verdict of uh, of guilty. And it's fair to say that the main issue at trial was that confession. So without the confession, there wasn't a lot of evidence. Uh, However, uh, there was a forensic scientist called Norman Lee 
who examined Stephen Downing's clothing, which was taken from him when he'd been a, taken to the police station, and on it they found spots of blood, which you can call a splatter, as, as the uh, forensic scientist described it, which was consistent, in his opinion, of somebody who had committed the assault. How can that affect the, the, the outcome of the trial? I think that's right, yes. The... The forensic evidence, um, as you quite rightly say, it was uh, Norman Lee who was called for the prosecution who actually said that the blood spatter on Stephen Downing's clothing, and I'm quoting here, might well describe as a textbook example of the pattern of blood staining which might be expected on the clothing of the assailant in a wounding such as that which Wendy Sewell suffered. So Norman Lee at the original trial definitely pointed the finger at uh, Stephen Downing. However, what I would say is that he was the person who found her and she was conscious at the time that he found her and it is noted by Stephen and other people who were who were there to assist that she was thrashing about so it's not beyond the realms of possibility that the blood splatter actually came onto his clothing by one kneeling at the side of her and trying to render assistance and two her thrashing about another interesting factor i've uh, gleaned from the paperwork is the Pathologist Professor Alan Usher, his statement said that when he did the post mortem, he found that Wendy had probably been uh, hit seven or eight blows to the back of her head, and other injuries on her body, such as being kicked and bruising to her Adam's apple, that may or may not suggest that he, she was strangled as well. However, Stephen Downing, in his his admission to the police and to the court only admitted that he'd struck her twice, I believe. Do you find this odd? Yeah, I mean, it is It is inconsistent, certainly in the confession that Stephen gave. He said he'd struck Wendy twice with the pickaxe handle and subsequently the pickaxe handle was the, found at the side of, uh, of Wendy's body and was obviously the the weapon that had been used to assault her. However, you're absolutely right that it does say in Professor Usher's report that she'd been subjected to seven or eight blows. So the confession wasn't consistent with what the pathology found. And the other thing that is striking is that after initially admitting it, he, he denied it all the way through his 27 years in prison. He was still detained as a murderer for many, many years, longer than he should have been. Yeah, the fact that he was eligible for parole, but the reason he didn't get parole was that he denied that he had murdered Wendy Sewell. And the fact that he was in denial of murder meant that he therefore didn't become eligible for that parole. So they kept him in custody. And you're right, if he'd actually admitted it, he would have been able to um, potentially walk from the prison gates. I think the only person who possibly could answer any of these queries is Stephen Downing himself. I understand he uh, lives in Bakewell, still in the vicinity of the graveyard where he lived with his parents at that time. I think we ought to go and uh, see if we'll talk to us and what he has to say. Yeah, I think we um, we try and make contact with, uh, with Stephen. I think you're absolutely right. From certainly the articles that I've read about Stephen Downing, he lives in the house where he lived with his sister and his parents back in 1973. So, uh, so let's try and make contact. I 
have uh, rung Stephen this morning and he's wanting to see us uh, today at the churchyard. Um, we're on our way to Bakewell to uh, to see him and he's bringing his sister Chrissy all being well who will uh, also have a chat to us about what happened. Yeah, because Chrissy's perspective on the um, on the matter is, is very different. Obviously she was a 14-year-old girl left at home while uh, he went to prison. Yeah, I was uh, surprised he wanted to see us at the churchyard initially, but uh, it seems like he's quite happy to go there. Um, his parents are buried there, in fact, so he said, I've no problem showing you where it all happened on the day and pointing out the various locations. Yep, and we've just turned left, and that's the old Forestry Commission building there. And the next road is Butch Road, but we don't need to uh, we don't need to go up there because there's no vehicular access out at the end. So if we go to the next road, that's Yeld Road, and that should lead us to the cemetery. Yeah, the Forestry Commission building looks as though it's vacant it, uh, in its day. It was uh, it was where Wendy Sewell worked, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, that's r that's right. OK, so we're almost at the end of Yeld Road and and there they are. There's Stephen and Chrissy waiting for us. So here we are at the gates of Bakewell Cemetery and I'm with Stephen. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. Um, and you have always lived in this area? You've always lived in Bakewell? Um, apart from just under a year when I lived at Chesterfield, other than that, I've always lived in Bakewell. So you got the job at the at this cemetery as groundsman? Yeah. And how did you get the job? Um, at the time, they had the officers in Bakewell Council, and I just went down, knocked on the door, says, if there's, if there's any vacancies, this is, yeah, we've got one for the working in the cemetery and uh, as a groundsman. And uh, if you want it, you can start Monday, sort to of think. Was <laughs> so you started work here, and um, when would that be? Late seventy two, early seventy three, something like that. Right, and did you did you like the work here? Yeah, I did. It was, I mean, it was hard graft because there's a big area to look after, and uh, but you you was your own boss. You work as you wanted, really, as long as the work got done, and uh, every, nobody came and checked up on you, so. And you'd not got much of a commute, had you? <laughs> no, not Five really. minutes? Well, we had to go down to the depot first thing in the morning, uh, check in at five to eight, and then officially you're supposed to start work at eight o'clock, but most of it was around nine o'clock after they'd had the tea and the, read the paper. <laughs> so, All the essentials. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so on that particular day, um, the 12th of September 1973, you came to work as usual? Uh, I'd, against my mother's wishes because I'd been off with a bad cold and uh, I said, you know, I can't take too much time off, I'll go in. And uh, everything just seemed normal, but right up to, until I found Wendy. So on that day, you went down to the depot, yeah. as usual, five to eight? Right, got there for five to eight, um, checked in and everything. I, I mean, I didn't have tea or anything like that, or I didn't read papers in them days. So uh, within about 15 minutes, I was back out and walking up here. In fact, no, on that particular day, um, two of the other colleagues, they were coming up to get a, a chimney cowl, so they said, we'll give you a lift up. And so you got a lift up from the offices yeah. up to the yeah. uh, cemetery? Yeah, uh, I said, well, in that case, we, I need some more petrol for the mowers and stuff like that, so... They got that as well for me, and they, they dropped me off at the unconsecrated chapel. And what was the first job that you that you did? Um, I think I, I clean up some of the grass that had cut the day before, and then just do some more mowing and tidying up and that sort of thing. But uh, it was an easy day that one. Uh, so, did you see anybody during the course of the morning? There was a few visitors, yeah. I mean, Mary Hatfield was one of them. She was a regular. She came in every day with her little dog and just had a walk round and 
often stopped and spoke. She said that she'd not seen me for a few days and I explained that I'd been off with a cold. So uh, other than that, everything was normal. Right, so we're just walking uh, now into um, the grounds of the, of the cemetery. And this first building before us, Stephen, uh, what's that? Um, that's, uh, that's a consecrated chapel. As far as I know, it still is a consecrated. But I don't know if it's actually used anymore. But uh, they used to use it as a chapel of rest. And, uh, and then the one further on is the unconsecrated chapel, which the council have always used, to my knowledge, as a storeroom. And that's where I was based for working and keep, keeping mowers and various other tools in there. Right. So as we walk from the gates and the gatehouse, I think that was occupied by Wilf Walker at the time, it was, wasn't yes, it? Yes. You can see we've got graves to both sides of us, and then outside the consecrated chapel, I suppose you'd call it a little island with a with yes, a yes. with a tree on it, and then the roadway carries on up towards the unconsecrated right, chapel, yeah, yeah. which was used as the... As the council storeroom. And what kind of things did you store in there? Anything, really. Uh, there were roofing materials, ladders. Um, there were a couple of park benches in there, uh, mostly mowers, rakes, pickaxes, and various other tools. And is that where you had your brakes as well, if the yeah, weather yeah. was bad? Yeah, there was a little stove in there. You could make a fire and keep warm. But off to the right-hand side, you've got a row of houses, um, the upstairs of which all look onto the, yeah, yeah. Uh, onto the cemetery grounds itself. OK, so we'll just... We'll just walk up towards there and then we'll just get some idea of where you were stood and where you saw Wendy. Did you know Wendy Sewell at all? No. It was only afterwards, after I'd been arrested now, that I found out my father knew her vaguely because he was one of the local bus drivers and she used to travel on the bus. Right. But you, you weren't aware of no, her at all? No. no. OK. Right, so you'd come out to have your cigarette. Yeah. Um, and where would you have been? The, where these bushes are, there's a set, some steps going down, and I was stood at the top of those. And uh, that's when I saw Wendy walking along this bottom path. So as you're facing the wood, she was walking from right to left? Uh, from left to L right. From left to right, yeah. sorry. And... Uh, I mean, to me, she was just like a normal visitor, not doing any harm. Well, over the past couple of weeks or so, I had some vandalism to the gravestones, and a friend of the family, uh, he'd, they'd recently lost a, a young child, and uh, they just asked me to keep an eye on their grave, and I said, yeah, I'll certainly do that. And obviously, I mean, she was uh, of the age that she's not likely to go around vandalising stuff. So once you'd finished your cigarette, you went into the... I went back into the unconcentrated chapel. Uh, I put my jacket on and picked up a lemonade bottle with the intention of going to the shop, hoping that they hadn't shut for lunch and unfortunately had when I got there. But uh, as I came out and walked down the centre uh, driveway, I noticed that uh, the woman that I now know as Wendy Sewell had obviously turned round and was walking back along the same path. So from, from your point of view then, you were stood here, you finished your cigarette, yeah. back into the unconsecrated chapel yeah. to collect your coat yeah. and your drinks bottle. Yeah. And then you walked out of the um, unconsecrated yeah. chapel, back down that, walked back down that central path that we've just walked yeah. along to get here. Um, and where was, as you walked down that central path back towards the consecrated chapel and the gate, where was Wendy? She was on the uh, bottom path, uh, run, it runs along the edge of Catliff Wood, and she'd be maybe 15, 20 yards in front of me. 
And when was the last time you saw Wendy? When's the last time you recall seeing her? Um, as I walked out the gate, she'd gone behind uh, what is a, a, no, still the consecrated chapel and there's a wood, little woodshed behind that. And she disappeared behind that. I didn't see her emerge from the other side. So I assumed uh, that she'd turned around and started making her way back along that same path. Um, I went out the main gate and headed up towards the uh, shop, which is probably about a two minute walk away. And I found out the door already closed for lunch. So with that, I left, went, made my way back to work. So from leaving the cemetery and getting back, how long do you think you were away from the, from the grounds? I would say possibly 10 minutes, certainly no more than 15. And when you returned, came back through the, the main gates, yeah. uh, next to the gatehouse, and where did you go from there? Um, I was walking along the centre of path. I noticed, uh, as I was walking out uh, initially, uh, Wilf Walker and his wife was at the uh, door of the lodge and uh, uh, I didn't see Wendy until I, I noticed somebody lying on the path between bushes. So you returned, came through the main gate, walked up that central avenue that we've walked along, yeah. and then whereabouts was, was Wendy um, when you first saw her? She'd probably been uh, about halfway down the path and... Uh, and, and it wasn't until I got closer that I noticed clothing was scattered about and stuff like that, and there was a fair amount of blood and everything. Um, I went over, knelt down beside her, checked for signs of life. She was breathing, but only just. It was quite shallow. Um, I went to the lodge and asked Wilf if he was on the phone, and he said, no, why? And I, I explained it to him. He says, oh, some of your work colleagues have come in. Maybe they'll know any so I managed to locate them and uh, they said no they didn't know anything went over and uh, then one of them went and called for the police and an ambulance I just want to interrupt Stephen right now what, what do we actually know about Wendy well she was an only child she was born in Sheffield um, at the time of her death her father had recently died um, her mother was also living in Bakewell. Wendy was quite a popular person, um, well known within Bakewell. And she was married to her husband, who was called David. They had split up um, for a period of time. And during that split, uh, Wendy had a child. She had a son with a local businessman. Uh, the child was subsequently adopted and I think now, obviously, is, a, is an adult and uh, and he's in Canada. Did she go back to her husband after this affair where she had the son? She did, yes. They, they managed to get back together again and, and heal the relationship. And as far as we're aware, till the point where she was murdered in the graveyard, they were still together, weren't they? They were, yes. We know that Wendy Sewell left her place of work around lunchtime on the day of her murder and went up, which is only a short distance, five, ten minute walk from her office to the graveyard. And that has always caused uh, an area of concern or an area of uncertainty as to why she actually went to the graveyard on that particular day. What's your research shown? Well, the the schools of thought are that because we know that she handed to John Osmiston, um, the person that she worked with, she handed to him a note that said she was going out for a breath of fresh air. Now, there is uh, one school of thought that says that she was going up to the cemetery to look at gravestones to get ideas for her father's gravestone. Her father had recently died and that was the reason for her 
visit to the cemetery and that's why she was there. The other theory is that she was there to meet someone. So uh, an arranged meeting uh, and that was the rendezvous for the meeting. So that's the the two main areas where people think that the um, that the reasons for her being in the graveyard is either one or the other. It's fair to say that Wendy Sewell, although she was married, had had a troubled marriage and had relationships with other men. In fact, I think she had a child out of wedlock. She did, she? yeah. Um, and, of course, a small rural town like Bakewell, the rumours fly around that, uh, you know, what was fact and what is fiction is always difficult to ascertain. But it's quite clear that she had seen other men and one of the theories was that she was had an arranged meeting on that day in the graveyard, which is not far from where she worked, but was quite secluded, wasn't it? That's right, and the theories about why she was there also sort of links into to the question who killed Wendy because if you believe that she was there to meet somebody somebody that she knew um, and it was an arranged meeting then that links in with Wendy was killed by somebody local a man and somebody known to her so we're back on this central avenue that comes from the main gates up to the yeah. unconsecrated chapel. So when you came back through the gates and you you saw Wendy, whereabouts was she? What what um, area? She was, <clears throat> as far as I can recall now, without going down there, um, she was on the bottom path, and I think I'd just come past this island. And I could, I noticed a line on the footpath. And uh, as I got a bit nearer, that's when I noticed um, there was some clothing and scattered around and everything. Uh, there was quite a bit of blood round up by her head and everything. And uh, I noticed uh, that obviously she was bleeding quite profusely, and uh, I checked for signs of life. And uh, that's when I went. To to uh, alert Wilf Walker and uh, see if he was on the telephone, call for his assistance. OK. When you say you checked for signs of life, what what did you do? I um, checked... I'd been in the uh, St John Ambulance for a while and uh, I checked the carotid artery and uh, it was a very shallow um, heartbeat and everything. But she was still alive at that time? She was still alive, but... Uh, struggling to breathe and and everything so obviously a case of trying to get help for her as soon as possible she wasn't responding to any sort of consciousness or anything like that she was sort of just making gurgling noises in the back of her throat so clearly there was blood present there and you said earlier that her clothes were yeah. spread about so was she um, she was partly naked, yeah. Um, yeah. Was there anything else of note? Um, <clears throat> there was uh, a pickaxe handle, which uh, it looked damaged and heavily bloodstained, at, certainly at one end, and there may have been some bloodstaining at the, the other. But uh, it did look quite a newish one, and it, as far as I was aware, it wasn't a one belonging to the council because I didn't see any uh, BUDC stamped into the handle, so... How close was the pickaxe handle to Wendy? Oh, only a matter of inches away. Um, it was virtually by her side. It must have where, where they dropped it or placed it there or whatever, I don't know. And you use pickaxes in the grounds? Very, very rarely. I mean, they this. I mean, there's tools there for, mainly for when they were grave digging, which is something I didn't do. Um, but uh, if if, they were, if it was needed, they were, they were there for that, and spades and stuff like that. And all that kind of equipment would be marked that it was... Oh, everything was marked and it was listed on an itinerary, which 
was kept down at the council offices and uh, I believe uh, I've, all their equipment was accounted for. And what was embossed on the handles of the property that belonged? It was uh, car, well, more or less heavily stamped in BUDC, Bakewell Urban District Council, which no longer exists. Um, it's, uh, it's now Derbyshire County Council and uh, everything comes under them now. And the pickaxe handle that was heavily bloodstained mm. and next to Wendy yeah. didn't have that embossed no. on the handle. No. Let's discuss the pickaxe handle that Stephen's just mentioned. Yeah, well, the pickaxe handle that was found at the side of um, Wendy had a clear shaft. It didn't have any name of the local authority. And I understand that all the equipment belonging to the local authority had embossed the name of the local authority, which would be BUDC at that time, Bakewell Urban District Council. Now, I understand that this embossment wasn't present on that pickaxe handle. So therefore, that beggars the question, did it belong to the council or had it been something that had been brought to the cemetery? So let's just think about the pickaxe handle. The options we've got or the theories we've got are that it may belong to the council and somehow it didn't get stamped correctly. The other option or theory we've got is that it was brought to the scene by the killer who assaulted Wendy with it and left it behind while he made his escape. We're now stood on that bottom path and when you first saw Wendy, she was by this grave of Anthony Naylor. That's correct, yes. And she was lying on her back? Um, no, she was face down and uh, I turned her over. And whereabouts were her clothes? Within literally feet of where she was. So around about her? Yeah. And it was obvious she'd suffered a very yeah. serious injury. Yeah. And when you came back, you went to Wilf, mm -hmm. ran to the unconsecrated chapel, yeah. and then came back down towards here. Yeah. But she was... She then moved probably 20, 25 feet, and she was over by this grave where the large crosses and, uh, and obviously behind those bushes we couldn't see uh, her move or if somebody had assisted her to move but uh, clearly she had somehow managed to get there and uh, and that's where she and then she tried to get up again as we approached and uh, one of the other work colleagues ran towards her but he, he couldn't get there in time and she fell again and banged her head on. Uh, I think it was one of these uh, surround stones. And uh, and that's when uh, one of them went and called for the police and an ambulance. And what did you do next? Not a lot I could do, I mean. Um, I was stood around talking to the other, the other work colleague and uh, as I say, within probably five minutes or so, they'd sent a, a PC up and uh, and he took over the, the scene and everything. And uh, I mean, he, he he didn't know what to do really himself, I don't think, and sort of just dithered about um, and eventually radioed through for uh, uni uh, non-uniformed police to come through. Uh, and there were a DCI and somebody, uh, and a few others came. Yeah. It's not the kind of thing that even now happens in Bakewell, is it? No, no. It's a very yeah. quiet... It is. It's a, I mean, you get a little bit of rural crime and that, but uh, nothing major. Nothing uh, serious? No. So when the police came, mm -hmm. they asked you questions? He asked her who found her and I, I said I had and everything. I said I've turned her over, checked for pulse and everything and uh, I said I've got some blood on my hands I said in doing so I says is it okay to go and wash them and he says no he says you have to leave them until you know 
with somebody else has checked it out and everything. So by which time they they arrived and it had dried on my hands by then. So and they wouldn't let me wash my hands either. Uh, asked me to go down to the police station to assist with any further inquiries and I was happy to do so and uh, I was there for about nine hours in total um, and uh, I asked to see my parents and the solicitor and they said oh you don't need one and uh, it, there's no, no need to trouble your parents or anything we're only asking a few questions and, uh, and in, in time they said well we need your clothes for forensic analysis so eventually they did have to uh, contact my father and ask him to bring me a change of clothes down. Well, after Stephen had been questioned at the police station for many hours, he admitted attacking Wendy and hitting her with the pickaxe handle twice. After making the admissions, the police wrote out his confession and Stephen signed it. In the weeks that followed, he retracted that confession and denied being involved in the attack at all. We've still got lots of questions to ask Stephen. What happened at the police station? The charge, his remand into custody, the trial his subsequent and lengthy imprisonment and the events that led up to his successful appeal. I feel we should continue with this interview in our next episode, don't you? Yes, I do. We need to hear the rest of Stephen's story. And both John and I would like to say a big thank you for listening to this podcast, the very first edition of our True Crime podcast series. It's been a steep learning curve for us, structuring the show and putting it all together. We are really excited about our plans for future episodes. We hope you are too and that you'll join us next time. Every graveyard holds many stories and many secrets about the individuals buried within the grounds and the living who come to visit them. On that day in 1973, as the ambulance took Wendy Seward's hospital and the police van took Stephen Downing to the station, a new, different, tragic story was about to be written. A story with its own secrets, and one that still has no ending. In the next episode of True Crime Investigators UK, we talk further to Stephen Downing about his life in prison and the events leading up to his appeal. Stephen's sister Chrissy also tells us what it was like for the family when Stephen was convicted of a murder they didn't believe he'd committed, and how the subsequent years in prison affected them all. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the True Crime Investigators UK podcast. This show was researched, produced and presented by John and Sally Midgley. The narrator was Stephen Mawson. It was edited and produced for Cornucopia Radio by Peter Beeston. You can find out more information and case notes about the Wendy Sewell murder by visiting our website at truecrimeinvestigators.co.uk. On the website, you will also be able to send us messages discover subscription links for all podcast platforms and follow us on all our social media accounts. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed so you can automatically get new regular episodes as soon as we release them. And also, if you enjoyed this series, we'd really appreciate you leaving a review or star rating in your favourite podcast application. Your support will help us grow and expand our true crime investigations even further. Thank you.